how does Prague commemorate the Holocaust today? Have I returned? I've returned many times. I happen to love Prague. I'm sure some of you love Prague too. Um, I speak Czech. Uh, I grew up singing Czech songs and eating Czech food. And um, if it wasn't so far away, I, I, would, I would get a second home there and spend time there. How does Prague commemorate um, the Holocaust? First of all, there are very, very, very few Jews in Prague. There are so few Jews in Prague that if you had one Jewish grandparent, you consider yourself a Jew and you come out as a Jew. This is also true in Poland, but of course in Poland there were more survivors than there were in, in, in the Czech Republic. In the Czech Republic, almost everybody was killed and then the people who weren't killed emigrated after 1948 like my parents did. Now, there are a few, very, very, very few, 100% Czech Jews, that means with, with uh, four Jewish grandparents, who did remain, but there are very, very few of them. My cousin was one of them. And um, my cousin grew up not knowing that he was Jewish. His parents did not tell him he was Jewish. They felt it was dangerous for him to know he was Jewish because some of you may know that in the 1950s, while there was McCarthyism here in, in, in the United States, Stalinism in, in Czechoslovakia was very anti-Semitic and it was dangerous for people to say that they were Jews. So what, who, the very few Jews they, there, that remained there went underground. Um, there was a Jewish community which still exists and um, that Jewish community survived under Stalinism and under communist rule. After 1989 and the Velvet Revolution when, when communism ended in, in Czechoslovakia, it was still then Czechoslovakia, um, that community got itself together and started rehabilitating the many synagogues that were in a state of total total, total wreck in, in Prague. And if you've been to Prague recently, you've seen that there are now, I don't know, seven or eight synagogues rehabilitated and that several of them serve as the Jewish Museum of Prague. And the community um, does hold services. There's one synagogue basically that is ultra-Orthodox and there's another one that is ultra the other way. And um, they, they do hold services there, but the community is tiny and um, I cannot see it really growing. But the Holocaust commemoration is uh, very serious and they're quite scholarly about it. What's really a bit peculiar is that um, the, the Jewish community in Prague, which really was not ultra-Orthodox for, I don't know how many generations, but many generations, is now ultra-Orthodox. Uh, so, they, uh, I, I have about um, 20 questions here, but there are really only four questions. Um, because everyone asked a lot of similar stuff, that uh, the first set of questions are, can you explain a little bit about the scientific research findings on epigenetic inheritance? And um, talk a little bit about that science that apparently I, well, I didn't get asked about. So, um, and and the biologic markers and why are mothers more um, prone to um, transmitting effects than fathers. So standing on one foot, um, I'll just give you the primer. So um, we all know that we, are, we have the genes of our parents. We have 50% of our father's genes and 50% of our mother's genes, and that makes up our unique biologic signature. That's our DNA, right? But what makes us who we are is not just the genes that we have, but the way those genes behave, how those genes work. And what what makes our genes behave, what makes some of our genes behave a certain way, has to do with experiences in our environment. What, one of the things that we found, we started out by asking a very simple question in our studies of second generation Holocaust survivors. It was really simple. We said, since, they, since Holocaust offspring are saying we're traumatized too, 
do they have the same biologic markers that we saw in Holocaust survivors, and in fact that we saw in other trauma survivors like combat veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder? It was a really simple question. And the answer to that question was, it depends. <laughs> um, if your parent had post-traumatic stress disorder, and then later if your mother had post-traumatic stress disorder, the answer to that question was yes you had many of the same stress hormone alterations, in this case, low cortisol, as your parent did. And that was kind of interesting to us. As we began to learn more about the molecular underpinnings of why that stress hormone level was low, we learned in trauma survivors that one of the reasons that cortisol, which is a stress hormone, one of the reasons that cortisol levels are low is because there are epigenetic changes. There are changes on the glucocorticoid, the cortisol receptor gene, that changes the way the stress system functions. And sure enough, we also found that in children of Holocaust survivors, if their mother had post-traumatic stress disorder, they had a very similar alteration. Now that doesn't mean that fathers don't have an effect on offspring. Everyone here that had a Holocaust survivor father knows that that's not true. But what it means is that whatever it is that was transmitted, it wasn't the, the regular genetics where you inherit things straight from your mother or your father, but that there might be differences between what you get from your mother versus what you get from your father. One difference between what you get from your mother and what you get from your father is that you get an in utero experience from your mother. And one of the things we learned is that if you are a trauma survivor with PTSD or without PTSD, you may experience pregnancy in a very different way and, that your, and your stress hormones in utero function in a certain way. And as you are the fetus in utero, you will react to the stress hormone environment in utero in a specific way. And that results in an enduring change to how one, eight, one or several of your genes function. And that is essentially what we learned. It's more complicated than that it always is. It has to do not only with the gender of the parent, but whether your mother was um, before puberty or after puberty during World War II. So as we're learning more about the science, and it's too much to tell you at once, but the take home message is, that the science is providing a reality to this idea that there are effects in the second generation that are more than just learning. A lot of people have said, how do you know it's not just learned? It's also learned. But it's more than that. And the, the changes that offspring have, they're not simply transmitted passively. They're accommodations that the offspring makes. So let me give you a, a little example. If your mother had the biology um, that helped keep her alive by adapting her stress hormones so that um, she could prolong the metabolic fuel in her body by changing how her stress hormones function, um, that's a very adaptive thing that probably kept your mother alive during starvation. Now, if your mother was young during the war, that enzyme that changed probably didn't come back after refeeding as it would have in somebody older. So in utero, you would have your, the, the, the change in this enzyme would have created more stress hormones in the environment and the fetus would adapt to it really by having a change in the stress hormone themselves ironically in the opposite direction. So some of the things that were transmitted or that were generated are, are the same as what the parent transmitted, maybe to prepare people for a better environment like starvation. 
The problem is that if you're not starving, you have an epigenetic change that isn't very useful to you and in fact may make you fat um, because food is available. So what we have is that gene by gene, we're trying to go through the differences um, in Holocaust offspring based on the paternal and maternal experience and also when in development that experience happened. So it's very um, slow work. Uh, we just finished one study where we've looked at the entire um, gene expression of all the genes and we are sort of parsing this out. But the take home message from the biology is that when offspring say, I am affected too, that has, an, that is, has a reality beyond learning. That has a biologic reality to it. And um, I hope that that answered those set of questions. Um, there are a couple of questions in here. Um, why did my parents uh, come to the United States rather than remain in Czechoslovakia, uh, as Imri Kertes did? Imri Kertes was not Czech, he was Hungarian, but he did remain in Hungary. And um, I, think, I think all of us should think about uh, why you remain where you are and why you don't uh, emigrate to another country when danger seems to be lurking around the corner. I mean, you know, some people feel, ha maybe they have higher or lower cortisol levels, maybe they're, they, they're more suspicious, um, my, my guess is that if my father, who was born in 1904, were around today, and he saw the state of American politics, I think he would get up and leave. Now, I left out of my presentation how my parents got to the United States, because I, I was trying to compress a lot into it, but it, it, it actually is a story worth telling. Uh, in 1948, my parent, in February, when the communist coup took place, my parents were living in an apartment in Wenceslaus Square. And those of you who are historians know that the communist militia were armed and they were marching in Wenceslaus Square, right below my father's windows. And in an often told family story, my parents got into a fight about what this meant. And my mother, who had very, very left-wing leanings, she was not a communist, but she had many communist friends, said, I don't see why we should leave. The communists are only gonna do good things. They helped me set up my business. You know, they were anti-fascists. They were the best people in the concentration camps. The Jehovah's Witnesses and the communists were the best people in the concentration camps. They helped everybody. They organized everything. Why should we leave? And my father, who was a very, very gentlemanly man, but was not as articulate as my very brilliant mother, ran out of words and he slapped my mother in the face. And my mother got terribly offended and she walked out, leaving me in my crib with my father. And it was February in Prague and she didn't take a coat. And she walked around Wenceslas Square with these militia people around and she came back and the story was, okay, I'll go. <laughs> And they left, and although they came legally, they came with absolutely nothing. The proverbial two suitcases and me in a carry, -on, carry bag. So you need to think, whoever wrote those questions, <laughs> you need to think about this in a very personal way. And I would like to say that for you teachers, I think that you should ask your students to write an essay about this. If you know that somebody is threatening your family, I have many gay friends who think about this all the time and who have figured out where they're going to go if, 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 if somebody comes and rounds up gay people into concentration camps. I think, it's a, I think it's a very, very useful question to ask. What are the pros and cons? How do you weigh staying or fleeing? How important is your life to you? What keeps you here? Is it family ties? Is it property? You know, these are, these are questions that I grew up hearing about all my life because my, my mother's parents refused to leave Czechoslovakia. They could have left. They didn't leave. My father's parents, as I told you, had, had a perfect exit. 
They were related to this very, very rich banking family, and this banking family hired an entire train and took all their bank employees and all their relatives out of Czechoslovakia in 1938. And my father could have been on that train, and the reason he wasn't was because of his mother, and his mother wouldn't leave because of her son. So, but this is a good question to ask your students. So there are um, a whole set of questions here about um, effects on second and third generation and also treatment related questions. Um, so there are effects in the second generation because the second generation had a trauma and the trauma that the second generation had was parents who survived the Holocaust. And it, was, it wasn't necessarily identifiable growing up, but it was something that the, ch that the child responded to. So the question is, what's going to happen to the third generation? And the answer is, is the second generation parent a trauma to the third generation offspring? And that is not a trivial question. Um, in our research, we see that some effects do not persist to the third generation, and some effects may persist to the second generation. But it has a lot to do of whether the third generation child has really felt swaddled in the Holocaust to the same extent that the second generation parent did. And now just to address um, just, just to address treatment issues, I, I first really want to make the point that the changes that are observed in the second and maybe even in the third generation, they're not necessarily changes that are negative. They're not necessarily changes that signify pathology. They are simply changes. The idea that we can respond to the environment by changing the way that our genes function. <laughs> if it's for me, tell them I'm busy. <laughs> oh, God. Um, if it's uh, by changing the way that our genes function, to me, it's the definition of resilience. Um, the, the idea that we can adapt to the environment to that extent, that we can really change the programming I mean, that is amazing. We used to talk about natural selection and how it took millions and millions and millions of years for natural selection to evolve and adapt into the refined specimens that we are today. But in fact, and somebody asked this too, to explain how it is that trauma results in an enduring biologic change. Almost every trauma survivor that you will ever meet will have one thing in common they will feel that they're no longer the way they used to be. The most common thing you hear from trauma survivors is, I'm not that person anymore. I am fundamentally different. What does that mean? They have the same DNA. Trust me, the sequence of their bases is as it was. But what's different is that there are now chemicals on the genes or the histones, which um, the DNA is wrapped around, or in the molecular environment, that are just going to change the way the program runs. I mean, you know, think of a, a piece of music that has notes on it, right? Anyone who plays a musical instrument knows that if you're just playing the notes, you are not playing music. Some notes are louder, and some notes are softer, and some notes go into each other, and some have sharp divisions. This is what epigenetics is to, to the notes that are our genes. This is the notation that you put in to play those notes to make them sound like music. They're not inherently bad or good. And in fact, if anything, they're probably designed to give you an edge should you be in the same situation. But thank God you're not in the same situation. So as one of my patients put it, Oh, I'm like a car with super good shock absorbers, so I feel everything. Yeah, exactly. Do you want to be feeling everything? 
It's not always adaptive. It makes you hypersensitive, perhaps. But was it transmitted to give you pathology? No. This is biology doesn't know about good or bad. Biology makes choices and decisions, and you're part of that. And recognizing that we have change and that environmental environments change us is the key to understanding that having good environments, healing environments, and healthy environments can counteract negative changes. It is the most empowering concept in biology that I have heard about in my lifetime. <laughs>